Part 22. The Despair of Judas. We must leave Jesus and his accusers here at the door of Pilate's court to record the dread event of which St. Matthew and later St. Luke have kept the memory. We left Judas with the crowd at the gate of the Garden of Gethsemane. From the way he there disappears altogether from the scene, we may make our conjectures. First, the crowd, once he had done his work, had no further use for him, and he was made to recognize it. Secondly, as with every first offender, no sooner had he done his deed than he realized his own deep shame. When the mob had taken Jesus and had passed with him across the valley, Judas stood alone in the lane outside the gate. He had stood there often before, and he knew the place well. But always till now, it had been with a companion. Now there was not one who would be with him, not a friend, not an enemy. Not Jesus, not any of the twelve, not a fellow countryman. Not any man at all, once he realized what he had done. The curse of Cain was upon him, and he, and he could only say with Cain, My iniquity is greater than that I may deserve pardon. Behold, thou dost cast me out this day from the face of the earth, and I shall be hidden from thy face, and I shall be a vagabond and a fugitive on the earth. Every one, therefore, that findeth me shall kill me. There is no need to go back with Judas and all that had happened during that night from the time he had played the traitor. Judas, even more than Simon, had followed it all. With a fascination he could not resist, he had followed the crowd, he had entered the hall, he had witnessed all that had been done to the master and friend whom he had betrayed. He had heard the sentence of Caiaphas and the rest. In the morning he had again been present in the court, and with his own ears had heard the condemnation. Jesus had been judged worthy of death by the highest authority of Jewish law without a shadow of convicting evidence. And Judas alone was the cause. He had been hurried away through the city that the sentence might at once be carried out and had offered no resistance. The deed of Judas seemed to have paralyzed him from the beginning. What had he done? The blood of Jesus was on his hands. The voice of God thundered out against him. Nature would cast him away as unfit any longer to live. Hatred had come into his soul, and he hated himself. What hast thou done? The voice of thy brother's blood crieth to me from the earth. Now therefore cursed shalt thou be upon the earth, which hath opened her mouth, and received the blood of thy brother at thy hand. He was a traitor. And for what? A murderer, and for what? A traitor and murderer of one who had loved and trusted him, and for what? For thirty silver coins, which a few days ago had seemed reward enough, but now were worse than worthless. All the rest had gone, the friendship of Jesus Christ, the company of the eleven, the tender love of that woman whose son he had betrayed. All the rest had gone, the joy in life that had been his long ago, the high ambitions, the desire to be and to do great things, the yearning after God, all had gone. Instead, he carried in him a dead soul, a heart icy cold, a life degraded below the life of any beast. He looked at the coins in his pouch, and he cursed them. They were as burning coals to his fingers as he touched them, heated with the fire of hell itself. He would have none of them any longer. He would fling them back at the accursed men who had tempted him with them. There were still some of them in the temple. Not all had been able to go with Jesus to the court of Pilate for the business of the Pasch had still to go on. Scarcely reckoning what he did, goaded on by the knowledge of his crime and of all he had forfeited thereby, aware that he was no longer fit to be called a human being, a fugitive and a vagabond upon the earth, Judas hurried from the house of Caiaphas. He rushed into the temple with all the signs of a madman, of one possessed. He burst into the hall where the rulers of Jerusalem were sitting, the hall where the contract had been made two days before. No longer the cringing, petitioning Judas whom they had then received, 
but now defiant, reckless of their high dignity, with hatred hissing through his teeth, danger glaring in his eyes, seeking only to throw on them some at least of the misery that overwhelmed him. And Judas, who betrayed him, seeing that he was condemned, repenting himself, brought back the thirty pieces of silver to the chief priests and the ancients, saying, I have sinned in betraying innocent blood. It was a confession, but a confession of despair, repentance, but without hope or love. And it was made not to God, of whom he no longer thought, but to those whose hearts had been long since hardened. If Judas was guilty, they were no less, and they knew it as well as he. But if Judas was so foolish as to lose his self-control and confess his guilt, that was no reason why they should follow his example. There were rules of self-respect which no man of honor would break, and that Judas broke them only proved that he was a country bore, and beneath their notice he was doubly contemptible, as the damned in hell confess their guilt to the devils, their masters, so did Judas confess his sin before these men, and in like manner was his confession heard. They looked down upon him from their higher platform. They despised him for a traitor and a coward. They looked at one another and were becoming they looked at one another and were becomingly indignant at this unseemly intrusion. The bargain had been struck. They had fulfilled their part of that bargain. What followed after was no concern of theirs, nor, for that matter, what had gone before. Let Judas keep to the terms of his contract, and they would keep to theirs. Whatever else they were, these masters of the law must be gentlemen, truthful and honest, and law-abiding. Therefore, once more, with that same show of justice, with which they had before proved to themselves the justice, the necessity, the duty of seeking the death of Jesus of Nazareth, these whited sepulchres now repudiated Judas Iscariot. He had not come there for sympathy, but out of hatred. He had not come for forgiveness and pardon, but to accuse. He could expect neither from those who had already said that he who claimed to forgive sins was a blasphemer. He who was the friend of publicans and sinners was a danger to the nation. But they said, What is that to us? Look thou to it. Judas could have expected nothing else from a court such as this. The contract could not be cancelled. The sentence passed on him whom he had betrayed could not be revoked. Already, even as he spoke, probably somewhere hard by, Jesus was being done to death. So triumphantly thought these ancients and chief priests. There was nothing left for Judas but to go. And since to live with this burden upon him, the outcast of God and men, would be worse than any death, it was better now that he should end his life and be done with it. It were better for him that he'd never been born. It were better for him had he never known this Jesus of Nazareth. Why had God made him? Why had Jesus given him his favor only to take it away again? He emptied the contents of his purse on the ground. The thirty pieces of silver fell jingling on the stone floor, many of them rolling to the feet of the men who had paid them. He hurried out as he had come in, caring not for anything or anyone about him. Next morning, a pilgrim coming up the valley outside the southern city wall saw a man hanging from a tree, and his body burst asunder. And casting down the pieces of silver in the temple, he departed, and went, and hanged himself with a halter. St. Matthew concludes his story with an account of the fate of those thirty pieces of silver. When all was over, and the chief priests, no less than Judas, but after their own manner, had realized what they had done. They were unwilling to have anything to do with this blood money. Much less dared they put it back into the temple treasury. It had done its work, and now like the scapegoat it must be cast out and carry their sin with it. They held a consultation regarding what should be done with it. The price of blood made them think of the dead. There was need of a burial place near the city, 
for such strangers as came and died there, especially during such times as the Paschal season. It might be well to use the money for that purpose. Outside the city, to the south, across the valley, and up the slope of the hill of Scandal, was a derelict piece of land which once had been a potter's field. It was cheap. The thirty pieces would suffice. It would serve their purpose very well. Nevertheless, it was never forgotten by the people whence had come the money that had bought that field, and for long years after, it was known as the field of blood. St. Matthew sees in this the fulfillment of a prophecy, which he quotes as from Jeremiah, but the passages seem to be adapted from the prophet Zachary. But the chief priests, having taken the pieces of silver, said, It is not lawful for us to put them into the korbana, because they are the price of blood. And having consulted together, they bought with them the potter's field to be a burying place for strangers, for which cause that field was called Hasildama, that is, the field of blood, even to this day. Then was fulfilled that which was spoken by Jeremiah the prophet, saying, And they took the thirty pieces of silver, the price of him that was prized, whom they had prized of the children of Israel, and they gave them unto the potter's field, as the Lord appointed to me.